Welcome to another episode of Pro Style Podcast, where I told you we always bring you some of the top receivers in the league. That's just what we do, man. Today, I got my man, Russell Shepard, on the line. LSU pride and joy, Houston, Texas native. How you doing, bro? I'm doing good, my man. How you doing? Thanks for having me this morning. Man, I appreciate you being on. And of course, I did some research to find out a little bit about you. And I noticed that you were one of the top quarterbacks in the nation. How's that arm still? Uh, it's not where it's, it, it should be, but uh, I haven't thrown, <laughs> thrown it in a while. But, yeah, I'm coming out of high school, man. I was um, one of the top Houston area, top quarterbacks in the, in, um, just in the state and the country in general out of my class. And uh, it's been an interesting journey throughout this far transition in the receiver. Yeah, man. So you're trying to downplay it a little bit. I ain't, I ain't going to let you do that, man. Uh-huh. USA Today All-American, Parade All-American as a quarterback. Just take us through playing at Cypress Ridge High School and being able to be that top player in the state. Well, you know, it was just a, a heck of an op- opportunity. The, um, that spread, the run, the run and gun spread with the quarterback being kind of a more of an um, athletic um, position um, was just kind of perfect timing for me where I was at. You know, on Cy Ridge, my head coach, Gary Thibault, um, he just kind of was one of the first guys in the Houston area to kind of get that going and um, just kind of work really good with my skill set, man, being able to touch the ball, you know, um, majority of the time in the game and just kind of take advantage of that, that zone read, which is kind of new at that point in time. You know, Chip Kelly wasn't even doing it too much at Oregon. So, um, like I said, just being able to utilize my skill set and trying to be the, one of the fir- first programs to kind of take advantage of that, it just yeah. took off. Yeah. So, as a quarterback, what was your favorite route to throw? Oh, man, I would have to say the goal ball, the nine ball, even, you know, still to this day playing the position. Every yeah. receiver feels like he can dominate on the nine, on the goal ball. So probably just throwing the goal, putting it up there, giving my receiver opportunity to make a play. For sure. What was the furthest touchdown you've ever thrown? Well, um, in the Under Armour game, I had a 99-yard um, – completion to uh, Andre DeBose. He was a Florida commit. Yeah. And actually, from that moment, man, um, we won. Uh, Under Armour had a special kind of um, a category at the ESPYs, and we won an ESPY for that um, that moment. It was a 99-yard mm-hmm. touchdown throw um, going into the half um, at the Under Armour game. See, that's big time. And you just tried to sit up here. You, you tried to sit up here and downplay, you know, I, I did a little quarterback here and there. My man threw a 99-yard touchdown in that one of the biggest high school games where it's like all the top players in the nation. Yeah. Like yeah, it, it, it was a great opportunity, man. You know, obviously Andre DeBose, some talented receiver at that point in time going into Florida, he made a heck of a play, but um, I still got the ball to him and, you know, we was able to, you know, um, get some hardware and just experience, yeah. you know, something that was unique. That's super cool, man. So here's another question. How in the heck did you get out of the state of Texas? My man went to LSU, played wide receiver, but how, what happened? Mac Brown wasn't appealing? What, what happened? <laughs> you know, just at that point in time, Mac was doing some really good things at Texas, man. They were coming off the national championship a few years prior to, but um, LSU, the recruiting class that we were having, um, you know, having, you know, numerous guys that are still in the NFL to this day. And um, a lot of talented guys that would kind of just come together going to one school. So I just, you know, felt like it was a perfect situation for me to go in and compete. And um, from my time at LSU, from that recruiting class to recruit, recruiting classes before and after, um, the, the list kind of goes on from Odell to Morris Claiborne to Jarvis Landry, you know, Patrick Peterson, you know, numerous of guys that are still playing. And um, like I said, I just wanted to play with um, – T- players players that were just as talented as me and yeah. I'm allowed that to kind of just kind of iron sharp and iron yes sir so I have to ask you know me playing at Vandy you know we got Jordan Matthews myself yeah, yeah, yeah. We got a couple guys that we put out in the league LSU man I I could just start with read and just keep going you know I mean yeah. there's so many guys that have been through that program that really excelled at the next level it's LSU to wide receiver you I feel like we're definitely we definitely are the most underrated I you know I, I'm that 
you hear DBU, LSU all the time, but yeah. I, I feel like the LSU aspect, you know what I'm saying, the receiver as far as the NFL, like you said, from Marie to a Ruben Randall to yep. a, uh, a Michael Clay to Skyler a Jarvis Green. Landry, Skylar Green. Yeah. I mean, and you can just keep naming guys, I mean, time to time. But at the end of the day, you know, it's, I think it's one of the most underrated um, places in the country where you can go and find a quality receiver, knowing yep. that we're a predominantly run team. And um, I just I think is you don't see too many programs like that that can produce that quality of receiver, knowing that the first demand is running the football. Yeah, that is pretty unique because LSU is known for running the ball, just like Alabama. You guys, yeah. ground and yeah. pound, it's hard to stop it. I don't care who you are. You know what LSU going to do every game. This is what they lead with. But yet it's still you guys always produce some of the top wide receivers. And I think that's – Super cool because when you look at most of the spread teams, some of the West Coast teams, they still haven't been able to produce how LSU have been at the receiver position. No, 100%, 100%. You know, I, I think a lot of times, too, being in such a, a, a pro style of offense there we at, go. at an early age, it, it, it un- helps you have a better understanding of, you know, being man, pre- you know, man coverage, getting open in certain zones, the timing aspect, which you don't really get – in the spread system, you know, when you're in the spread system, it's kind of a, it's a, it's, it's a chess, it's a chess game, you know, you yeah. just kind of just slowly but surely just moving your piece and eventually one pops open where when you're in a timing situation, a West Coast style of system, depth, you know, um, importance of knowing where you're supposed to be in certain places, it goes a, a long way, so. Yeah. I, I like how you just plug pro style right there too. Yeah, 100%. 100%. It was real cool. Uh, A lot of people don't understand, you know, what pro style mean and how it relates to, you know, sports. But in football, pro style is a a, a type of offense. And it's super cool because when you see Alabama, you see LSU, those guys, they're still running a pro style offense where some of the guys are are uh, tending to go towards that Chip Kelly, that West Coast offense, which is a little different. But you were drafted, you were undrafted in 2013 by the Eagles. Coming into the league, did you have a chip on your shoulder? You feel as if you had to prove something, you know, being that top, you know, player in the nation coming out of high school, going to LSU and then being undrafted? Yeah, yeah. I think you just hit it on the nail. Being as successful as I was coming out of high school and um, just kind of going into to college with so many expectations, but really not having to understand in what position I was going to play. It played, you know, all those th- different things played into, you know, me um, not having as much success as, I, as a person with my talent should. And then also, too, going to a program where we don't, we don't spread the ball around a lot. We don't do a lot mm-hmm. of different things. So, you know, I definitely had a chip in my shoulder going into the, N- going into the NFL, knowing that I feel like I, I – I could have been drafted. I should have been drafted, yeah. especially now going on, you know, going in on my seventh year. But, you know, um, I, I think at the end of the day, I was just – it helped me become that much more, more of a better pro because I had a better understanding of the importance of every day, you know, making your mark in practice, making plays in practice, the importance of it's a job. It can be taken away at any given time. You know, sometimes being drafted can be a double-edged sword. Yeah. Well, then you get released by the Eagles. You get picked up by Tampa. A lot of people ask me, what's it like to play for Lovey Smith? You had the privilege of playing with Lovey. How was it playing down there with him? Man, Lovey is one of the – you know, you know, the game we play, man, it's, it's, it's made up of so many stereotypes and it's made up of people have – certain ideas of what they think football is. And I will say, you know, prior to playing under Coach Smith, I never seen a coach be able to coach and get the most out of his players and still hold them to a certain standard of um, how – I want – just treat them like men. You yeah. know, everybody has their role. Nobody's bigger than anybody. He was the, the true – you know, um, you know uh, he, he, he embodied – he embodied family. He embodied um, being a, a man of faith. He embodied treating everyone the same. Man. Yeah. Because I'd never been around a coach that just really treated everybody, man, with so much respect and just kind of got the most out of his players without screaming. Yeah. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Really good man. <laughs> yeah. I don't think I've ever heard Levy scream. I, I, I've seen him, you know, dissatisfied with our play and coming in and just letting guys know, like, hey, 
we can do better. You know, we got to pick this up. Let's rally. Let's get things going. But I don't think I've ever heard him scream in that school because guys still wanted to play hard for Lovey just because he was a player's coach. He was a guy that wanted to win. He was a guy to make sure everybody was in the right position, especially defensively. And he just likes to get out there, you know. And like you said, there, there's so much respect for Lovey, you know, in that locker room. For every guy that played against him across the board, I haven't met one guy that's like, yeah, I ain't like Lovey Smith. You know, like everybody that I know, like, loves it. And that's hard. It's being in this league at times as a coach, as a front office, you know, um, person, you have to do things that are, are typically not, you know, don't make you look good. You know, typically, yeah. you know, the players and, and, and whoever's making no decisions don't see eye to eye. So when you can um, coach as many years and be as successful as, as, as successful as long as Lovey has, has been and have so many positive things um, to say, people to say about you throughout your time in the league, it says a lot about your character and who you are. Yeah. So you're going on year seven. With the Giants, you guys dropped a quarterback that had everybody saying, what in the hell are the Giants doing? Everybody's trying to figure out what what are they doing? Why did they reach so far for this kid? But tell me, what have you seen so far from him? I mean, he is he's Eli. I mean, he's the per, from the personality to the strong arm, the, the, the low-key, um, the sneaky athletic ability being able to make plays outside the pocket, pocket, keep plays alive. I mean, um, it makes sense once you see him play. Yeah. You know, it takes a unique personality to take on the, the, the New York media to mm-hmm. be a part of the, you know what I'm saying, the New York football giants. It's one of the first original football teams in this, in this, in this league to ever, that for them to ever have. And it's a lot of, it, a lot of rich history around this organization. And then, like I said, you throw in the fact that it's in a, a city as strong as New York City, one of the biggest cities in the world. Yeah. Um, you need a, a person that that really doesn't take things too personal, a person that's about the next play. I think the mental is just as big as the physical traits when you're talking about bringing in the franchise quarterback to the city. Right. Like, Yeah. Well, I mean, it's going to be interesting to see what happens, especially throughout the season. If you guys do well, you guys do bad. But I had Brayden going on the show, and we talked about replacing Odell. As a receiver, how anxious are you for the first game to get started to prove to most of everybody that you guys can replace that production? No, just taking it just one definitely definitely really you know excited about the opportunity you know a guy like Odell he demands the ball a lot not not vocally but just his play when you play at that type of level you need to get that individual the ball right and, um, the only thing about football is that you know it's a long field and it's one ball so you know <laughs> at times it, it, the ball can only go so many directions throughout a, a game but yeah. um like I said you know that's 10 to 15 targets that are about to be split up amongst, you know what I'm saying, Saquon Barkley, Sterling Shepard, you know, uh, Evan and um, our tight end and whoever else, you know, gets the staff's um, confidence and trust to make plays. And one thing I would say about um, our head guy, Pat, our play caller, um, he does a good do- job of, you know, distributing the rock and, you know, taking the guy- taking advantage of guys' skill sets and kind of making every – putting everybody in a good position to have success. Yeah. Well, I need to see you out there more, man. You know what I mean? Like, I, I need to see you out there getting some of those touches. I know you're going to have a great season this year. So, Pro Style looks at the symmetry between hip-hop and sports. If we had to take your, your phone right now and play a song, what would we probably hear? Oh, man. you definitely going to hear some Drake, as, as most people probably will say. Um, you know, I'm a Houston kid, so you know what I'm saying? Here we go. True to my roots, you're gonna probably hear some Slim Thug. You're gonna hear some um, some Travis Scott right now. You know mm. he's really going hard for the city yeah. and just everything he's about. But uh, you know a little bit of everything, man. Like I said, I know right now I'm heavy on my H Town um, guys, and um, I just try to stay true to what I'm with, am with that. You know what's funny is when I was in high school, eleventh grade, um, DSR. They dropped the mixtape, and they they dropped that that throwback song that was screwed up. I felt like I was from Houston. 
<laughs> like, like that like i played that song so much like my homeboy was like yo i ain't gonna ride in the car with you unless you start playing something else but i really enjoy the houston music the sound that comes from here because it's unique it's different you ain't gonna find it nowhere else and so i always love you know playing like a dsr or yeah. like a slim thug or Lil flip or Lil kiki somebody like that like <laughs> that's what you know what i mean like i used to like listen to it all the time man what's the symmetry that you see between hip-hop and sports so i have a lot of guys that come on and they talk about the competitive nature they talk about being the underdog what's the symmetry that you see um you know what i take it a little deeper man i just see you know, um, I think especially nowadays with the urban culture being where we're from and who we are as black men and black women, yeah. I just see um, an opportunity for, you know what I'm saying, um, certain individuals to make it out, whether it's being on the creative side, using your mental, using your, your vocal skills and being able to create opportunity for yourself and your family and um, just kind of create a legacy for yourself or as you're the physically talented kid, you know what I'm saying, on the courts or on the fields. And um, I, I just look at everybody as kind of um, opportunities to better, you know, themselves, their families, and they're doing it in their unique way. Um, I think everybody's talented in their own rights, but um, I think, you know, at times society, society and entertainment glorifies certain talents. Yeah. And I think when I see us as athletes and I see us as entertainers, I just see, you know, young men and young women using their talents to create opportunities to do other things, you know what I'm saying? Um, and just kind of just create, you know what I'm saying, the culture. Yeah. So you, you hit on something there. Talk about opportunity. We had a chance to speak a little bit about your business ventures, things that you have going on. You about to open up a, a commercial real estate. You want to talk about that a little bit and how being in more than just an athlete and showing that, you know, how multifaceted, you know, athletes are in different ways. You know, no, definitely, definitely, man. You know, um, this is my seventh year in the league. Um, I've had opportunities to start a business or two throughout my time. My first business was, was with my family. We started a trucking business. We did some good things with that. And um, throughout the years, my mom and dad has kind of took it on that full, full time. And that's what they do. Nice. And as well as now, um, I'm getting into the real estate. I've been able to buy into a few deals throughout my time in the league. Actually, I just bought into a um, a pet palace, which is a um, a pet grooming, and um, you know, um, it's kind of a pet place where you can just kind of do anything you want to do with your animals. <laughs> yeah, but um, me cool. myself, man, I um, I can say there's plenty of other things I'm looking to get into, as far as apartment complexes. You know, continue yeah. to pur purchase in certain commercial real estate properties, and just kind of taking an opportunity to play to play in this game and making some great money and using it to kind of create what, we, what they say, generational wealth, and um, being able to diversify my portfolio, my money, and my resources so I can, you know, do some um, some big things for my family going forward. Yeah, man, that's awesome, man. That, that It's always great to hear stories like that, guys who continue to build, not just, you know, from a football perfect perspective and on the field, but off the field with business ventures. So I wish you all the best, man. This has been super cool, super fun, man. How can the people follow you on social media? Well, I'm on Instagram. I'm on Instagram at Russell Shepherd, um, 19, and that's R U S S E L L Shepherd S H E P A R D 19. And um, like I said, right now I'm just heavy on Instagram, trying to just you know shorten the gap on financial literacy, continue yeah. to kind of just push me, myself, and my family out there, man. And it's a positive and it's a good message. Hey, man, that's my man, Russell Shepard. Y'all make sure y'all go follow him on Twitter. Bro, I appreciate you for rocking out with Pro Style today. Not much love. Thank you, man. Yes, sir.